My inheritance has cost me. The car and gadgets are nice. And I've almost gotten used to the smell in the cave. It's the criminals. Since my father died, they focused their attention on me. Hey man, somebody killed this lady. And the people around me. My father's enemies have gotten more twisted with age, more violent and suicidal. Crashing this plane with no survivors. Because they know their inevitable end is near. They've seen Batman die. They've seen each other die. I can't believe they killed him. Yeah, man, things are getting really bad out here. The Riddler. This puzzle is far more than any mere game. Hmm? Dr. Death. You and I go way back, Batman. Two-Face. I still believe in Harvey Dent. All gone. Like the life I hoped for beyond this mask. Everything I have, everything I am, is because of him. I'm the Batman's daughter. I am the Huntress. And tonight, I'm hunting the man who destroyed my life. Hello and welcome to the Huntress Podcast. This is episode number 32. I'm Ashford and along with me is Laurel. Hello, Laurel. Hello, Ashford. And we also have Diane. How are you doing today, Diane? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for asking. Yes. So this is episode 32 of the Huntress Podcast. This is the Right On Network and I'm happy to discuss this and talk about uh, this one, this is All Star Comics number seventy four. Uh, let's look at this cover, Diane. What do you think about this cover? Well, I think that the cover is actually um, it's doing a nice job of conveying that the just society is actually responding to a crisis, but we don't know what crisis they're actually responding to. They're just kind of charging ahead. But then you're kind of wondering, you know, was it that what's happening? You know, you see a you see a hand, you know holding the Just Society characters and you're wondering who does that hand belong to? So there's there's a bit of mystery to the cover as well. So on the one hand, great composition by Joe Statton that shows, depicts the Just Society, you know, charging up for a fight, but then at the same time, what's with that hand underneath the group, you know? So it does create a mystery as well for the, for the viewer to entice them into reading the story. Oh, I didn't even notice the hand. I was so busy just looking at all the different characters. I was like, oh, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Laurel, what do you think about this cover? I like it. I like it. I like the way the characters are depicted. The charging at you thing is very superhero-y kind of cover. I didn't notice the hand at first either. I I'm with you, Ashford. I just was looking at the characters. They're so um, bright and coming at you. Um, I did find one thing funny. Power Girl's the only one with an open mouth. I thought everybody else has this grim expression and she's, she's the only one. And I was like, okay, that's just weird when I found it. Now I can't stop looking at it, if you know what I mean. But I really do like this cover. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is very eye-popping. It's like, whoa, what's this in the comic book store? Or on the spinner racks or just some store where they were selling other things and comics at that time. Uh, this came out in 1978. This is written by Paul Levitz. As Diane mentioned, uh, pencils by Joe Staten, uh, Staten, uh, inks by Joe Gila, uh, colored by Adrian Roy, covered by Dick Giordano and Joe Staten. Uh, and this has a page count of 26 pages and it came out September or has a cover date, September 6, 1978. But yeah, cool cover. What's going on inside this book? Diane, can you give us the synopsis, please? Absolutely. So All-Star Comics number 74 opens up with Dr. Fate and Hawkman in another dimension, having been summoned by a hyperdimensional being known only as the Master Summoner. His message, the stars have aligned in a way that will bring about the destruction of Earth 2. Back on Earth 2, Helena Wayne, also known as the Huntress, and Karen Starr, also known as Power Girl, enjoy an exquisite lunch at a posh Gotham restaurant while the two discuss Karen's struggles with keeping her civilian identity separate from a superhero identity. Just as Helena pays the check, the two women are summoned to JSA headquarters by Dr. Fate. With all the Just Society heroes gathered up at the Gotham headquarters, Dr. Fate breaks out the news that 
Crises will arise on Earth too that will result in the end of the world if they do not put a stop to them. Just as they have that conversation, two crises arise in the two different parts of the world, one in between China and Russia, and another squarely in the middle of Montreal, Quebec. The JSA then split themselves into groups of two. Hawkman, Power Girl, and Green Lantern take on the crisis between Russia and China, while The Flash, The Huntress, and Dr. Fate take on the one in Montreal. Team Hawkman successfully ends the conflict between Russia and China, but their interference unwittingly causes a young Russian soldier to be able to wield the power of Green Lantern's green flame uncontrollably. In Quebec, the Flash and the Huntress have successfully stopped a terrorist group from attacking the women's convention taking place in the city of Montreal, while Dr. Fate learns from the convention's organizer the reason for the terrorist attack. In the organizer's possession is a device with the ability to eliminate language barriers. Dr. Fate's meddling, however, causes the device to activate and prevent the people present from understanding each other. After the Just Society succeeded in their task, the Master Summoner moves forward with their plan to destroy Earth 2. The Just Society are at first confused about how the heck things were made worse following their intervention. They soon realize what is really going on. The Master Summoner had exploited the Just Society's penchant for protecting their world by creating crises they would naturally respond to in order to set into motion the chain of events that would lead to the world's demise. The Justice Society quickly realize that the more they intervene, the more they interfere, the stronger the crises get, and that the only way to prevent the Master Summoner's plan from seeing fruition is for them to ride out the storm and allow the crises to resolve themselves. The Justice Society's plan succeeds, and the Master Summoner is defeated, but not without but not without threatening to return. And this concludes All Star Comics number 74. During the days of World War II, a group of costumed mystery men gathered together to form the first and greatest superhero team of all time. Now, fighting alongside the surviving original members, a new generation of heroes has been born. Promising to uphold the legacy their predecessors created and inspire other heroes across the world. Today, the Justice Society of America lives again. Mr. Terrific, Hawk Girl, Jakeem Thunder, Star Girl, Hawkman, Green Lantern, Dr. Midnight. Our Man, Sand, Power Girl, Crimson Avenger, Shazam. The Spectre, Wildcat, Dr. Fate, Atom Smasher, Black Adam, The Atom, Ma Uncle, Airway. So join the Feathers and Foes and Birds of Prey podcast where we will discuss the event before the event, Countdown to Infinite Crisis, Ashford, Laurel, discussing the illustrious Justice Society of America, issues 73 to 78, Black Vengeance, OMAC Projects. You're going to want to be there. Oh, we're going to be a part of these lovely array of other podcasters to discuss one of the greatest runs in the DC universe. All right. Well, that was a, a nice recap of it. This was a, a little bit longer. Um, I was when I was reading this, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is going to end really suddenly. And then it, I, the page count kept going. I was like, oh, OK, that was pleasant. So um, aside from the long uh, thing, Ashford, what did you think of this? issue did you like it overall i usually like a format like this where it starts off kind of domestic we see the huntress and power girl just sitting there um you know having lunch and then all of a sudden the action happens and uh it was very like dr fate driven but it, a lot of it it was kind of hard for me to take purchase of i, I read it twice and i was just like it, it, it didn't it seemed like it didn't have a a structure and usually that doesn't bother me, but, but with this, I had a hard time just kind of 
following along with, wait a minute, what's going on here? Diane, how about yourself? I actually quite enjoy this issue, but probably mostly for the Power Girl and Hunter scene. But I think in terms of story and structure, I think that Paul Levitz was doing something interesting with this story where the Justice Society found themselves in a situation where they where their own penchant for protecting their world was used against them. So the challenge there was actually quite interesting, but I was kind of disappointed by the way it concluded. I was kind of hoping that, you know, they would, you know, put their heads together and figure out, okay, how can we stop these crises from happening without making the problem worse? And just writing out the storm, okay, understandable, but also anticlimactic. So I actually like that the story actually centered on, you know, the just society being presented with a challenge that they cannot usually respond to the way they normally would. But I just wish that the, the ending, the solution would have been better thought out, in my opinion. Well, you know, I had trouble with this because um, it centers around Dr. Fate most of the time. And it's like, he's just so arrogant. And I don't know if that's supposed to be part of his character, because this is not an era I'm really familiar with. Um, but he keeps being like, uh, we're doing this because it's me, or the people don't understand, but they'll follow him anyway, the rest of the Justice Society. And I didn't care for that aspect of this. Um, there were parts when the Huntress is doing her stuff, which, you know, is always enjoyable to see. But like you were saying, Diane, I would have liked it if the group had talked it over. If Dr. Fate said, oh, I figured it out. It's, you know, we interfere and it causes problems. And then the group decided what to do amongst themselves rather than him sort of ordering people what to do. It's like every time you need something, oh, well, he pops up and has an answer. And I, I didn't care for that part of this, but the rest of it was pretty good and we can get into more about um, some of the other characters but let's go ahead and look at the um, Helena and I guess it's Karen right Karen Star Diane explain to me because is Power Girl never had a secret identity I don't quite understand what was going on in this first scene at the at the restaurant between the two women so this one you kind of have to um, you kind of had to have read um showcase number seven number 97 through 99 which is a three-part you know power girl story that better fleshes out his story and prior to that story power girl did not have a civilian identity she just kind of showed up at the scene and she was just power girl and but no one actually knew her origin story no one knew what her actual what her actual identity was outside of being power girl so showcase numbers 97 through 99 kind of fleshed that out and so that story establishes that she is Kara Zor-El um, with an with an uppercase L, not E-L, like the Supergirl of Earth-1. So this character is Kara zor -El. She's also from Krypton, but she's not from Argo City like Supergirl is. She's actually from the city of Kandor. And so, so Power Girl, the Power Girl story is similar to Supergirl's, but also very different, whereas on pre-Crisis Earth-1, Supergirl actually grew up on Krypton. She got to experience Kryptonian culture, you know, from a very young age up until she was a teenager, and then she was rocketed off from Argo City to uh, where Kal-El was sent to, which was on Earth. Um, Power Girl, by contrast, um, was rocketed off of Krypton when she was an infant. So unlike the Earth-1 Supergirl, who is actually older than Kal-El, the Earth-2 the Earth yeah, the Earth-2 Power Girl is actually the same age as Kal-El. They were both infants when they were both sent off off of Krypton, you know, to safety. The thing is that kal -El ship was actually a much better ship. It was better structured, better equipped with, you know, speed to get him to Earth faster. Whereas Power Girl ship, you know, was kind of made very last minute. And so she didn't really get a spaceship that is the same caliber spaceship as kal -El. So her ship, you know, was in space much longer and it took her literally six decades six decades to get to earth two and so during that time that she was in a spaceship you know she actually grew up inside the spaceship but she also grew up in a virtual reality so she experienced kryptonian culture as a virtual reality versus the earth one kara who experienced that in real time on the actual planet so when power girl actually arrived on earth she was roughly about 18 years old in age so she was very she was very young. She was still very much a teenager when she arrived on Earth. And so when uh, Supergirl, not Supergirl, Superman discovered her, 
um, he kind of took her under her wing, kind of started to mentor, mentor um, Power Girl off panel. And originally she was not supposed to show up when she did because um, she, super, Superman did not feel that she was actually ready to go out into the world and make herself known. But when she responded to a crisis in China, which was a volcano erupting, she made herself known and she immediately joined the Just Society. So prior to, prior to that, you know, Karen didn't really have a life or Kara didn't really have a life. You know, she was just power girl. And so when, when she started cementing herself in Earth 2 society or American society, I should say, um, as she started becoming more noticed, you know, she got the attention of a um, reporter named Andrew Vinson. And Andrew wanted to get to know who Power Girl is. And that's when we learn more about Power Girl's origin story. And he also, once he learns that she's actually an alien, he tries to help integrate her into Gotham society because she's actually residing in Gotham, not Metropolis. And Vincent or Andrew Vincent tries to, as he basically helps her establish an identity outside of being Power Girl. And that's where the Karen Star identity came from. He actually helped her establish that identity. And the Amazonians and Wonder Woman, they helped her, you know, develop skills for becoming a software engineer. And so that's who Karen Starr becomes. She, they help her create a resume, basically, and they allow her to find a job as a software engineer at a software company. And so that's what Power Girl is. By this point in the narrative in All-Star Comics number 74, she just recently established her Karen Starr identity, but at the same time, she does not know how to separate her Power Girl identity from her Karen Starr identity, you know, she knows who she is as Power Girl, but she has no idea who she is as Karen. And she doesn't know how to fake being Karen. And so that's what she's talking to Helena Wayne about in the story. Now, of course, you know, Helena Wayne does not have that obstacle because, you know, her Helena Wayne identity is very well established. That's who she was prior to becoming the Huntress. And it's easier for her to, you know, create a separate identity, create a separate, I guess you could say, sort of personality for the Huntress to keep her separate from Helena Wayne. But Power Girl has no idea how to do that. So that's basically the conversation that they're having um, during the lunch scene where Power Girl feels very self-conscious. She's actually wearing civilian clothes during the scene. She's not in her Power Girl costume. And she's, she's very self-conscious of the fact that she can't really hide who she is as successfully as Helena Wayne can. And so she's thinking, you know, I feel like so many people are watching me. I feel like I've got so many eyes on me that if I screw up or if I move in a certain way, I'll give off the fact that I'm Power Girl. And she accidentally breaks a glass in that scene. And Helena's like, relax, Karen, you know, you don't have to think too much about it, you know. Just take into account that no one here actually cares who you are and they, they're definitely not going to suspect that you a uh, young girl with blonde hair and a pink outfit it has the strength to break a glass, you know. We can just tell the waiter it fell. And so that's basically where they're at. They're basically trying to... She, Helen is basically trying to help, you know, Car relax, you know. Don't worry, don't think so much about the fact that you're power girl, you know. Just enjoy yourself, you know. Just ignore the fact that other people are in the room, or in this case, on the roof, mm -hmm. and just... Enjoy yourself. So that's what that's what Power Girl is. She's she's in the middle of trying to figure out who Karen Starr is. She knows who she is as Power Girl, but she doesn't know who she is as Karen. And that identity, that part of her identity, is not fully developed yet. And so Helen is basically trying to help her. You know, relax. You know, don't think about it. Just you know, just be you. You know, but mm -hmm. you know, just don't use your, just don't use your powers. But that's it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked the scene because I like to see that Helena Wayne has a, a nice confidence about her, which was pleasant to see. Um, and of course, when they, they go into costume and she's hanging onto Power Girl's waist as she's sort of uh, leaping or, or flying them uh, to the JSA headquarters. Ashford, what about you? What did you think of this initial scene between the two women? One, I love Helena's outfit, the, the style of it. It looks like... Uh... Where in Karma San Diego are you? <laughs> yes, it does. So I, I just I loved, I just loved that she was stylish, and we also get in there when she signed for it. She was like, "Hey, this isn't on the firm this time. I'm paying for this." 
So uh, we have a good character here where, you, you know, she's wealthy, she's working, and she's a superhero. So, you know, I understand why Diane is an advocate for the character because, I mean, this is something you could run with. And uh, you could tell that they see that in here. You know, I can't wait to explore for, explore her further. But, yeah, this opening scene, I loved it. Well, we've got the next one up with her in it. Was uh, We have these two battles. We've got uh, one team that's battling in the China-Russia. They're interfering in, in a military attack, I guess, a skirmish of some sort between the countries. And then this women's conference is where Helena ends up as Huntress with Flash and Dr. Fate. And I like Dr. Fate was sort of hanging out outside because he was trying to figure out what the, the main thrust of the problem was going to be while Flash and Huntress go inside the conference and they find a terrorist attack underway and have to take over. I found it interesting that Jay Garrick as the Flash was taking direction from the Huntress that he sort of hesitated and she's the one that came up with the idea of how they were going to go forward. I really liked that scene. I liked her confidence there. This was a, a good uh, a good showcase for her. Um, Diane, I'm assuming you enjoyed it as well. Oh yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite scenes in this story is seeing her work with Jay Garrick. And we also see her leadership skills in this one scene as well. So we see that, you know, Helena is able to, you know, give instructions, but she doesn't give orders. She doesn't tell people what to do. You know, she's saying, okay, so this is a situation. So she assesses what's going on first. And then she's, she basically thinks about, okay, so this is what we need to do. So we do see two things here we see her leadership skills and we see her ability to strategize you know in very short notice so she's not you know she doesn't plan ahead she's not in a place where she can actually plan ahead she's actually in a place of okay so this is what's happening right here right now this is the best way to deal with that situation so definitely that fight sequence with it with um helena fighting the terrorists is actually one of my favorite scenes in there and so while she's fighting the bad guys, you know, Jay Garrick is actually deflecting the bullets for her, you know. So I, I really love that one panel where, you know, there's a guy, you know, shooting at Huntress, but none of the bullets are actually hitting her. And he's like, is this Power Girl? Is this this Power Girl I've been hearing so much about in the States? And uh, that panel really made me laugh. I'm like, yeah, if only that was Power Girl. Now nah, it's just Huntress. So I, I guess you could say that Huntress by this point is not yet well established, but Power Girl very much is because she's already been doing this for a whole year now. She's, or at least in real time, she's been Power Girl for a whole year. So she's been working with the Just Society for a whole year. So she's kind of well known outside of the US at this point. So Helena is now in a place of just barely getting started and she's now becoming well known as a Huntress. Or at least that's her plan anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I did like that we had an appearance of the crossbow. That's how she's um, shooting out her bat lines uh, the, that she swings on the ropes. Um, but what I found interesting, I would have liked to see more of her goodies. That would have been fun because she's taking on like this crowd of men. It, it is really, you know, she's really socking it to them, so to speak. Uh, but one of the things that surprised me was Jay, um, the Flash, it wasn't working because he's like, I'm not as young as I used to be and he can't catch the bullets and um, go on the offense at the same time against these. And they're back to back. They're going to come up with a new plan. Of course, Dr. Fate comes in and, and finishes saving the day. But I just thought it was interesting how they kept relying on her. That was really neat to see her do these things. We had her nice, confident in civilian codes. We have her nice, confident as Huntress. It was really enjoyable to see her um, in that manner. One other fight scene here that I really wanted to point out um, is when they go up against, what was he, the Master Summoner or something? I can't remember the big bad's name again. And the, JS yeah, the JSA are taking on the character and she sort of, leaping she she's doing some sort of a gymnastics trick of some sort trying to go up this big great big giant body that they're all attacking i just found that shot that particular panel just totally amused me i don't know if you guys noticed that when you were looking through these what i noticed is that she wasn't she didn't have her cape on while she was doing that dive to me it looks like she was diving is you that kind of like how yes yeah, trying to figure out what the you know the little motion lines i thought maybe she was flipping herself upward yeah, it looked to me like she was diving. Um, to, at least, you know, when you go, 
I don't know, whenever I think of the Olympics, you know, the divers, they're on a very high, you know, pedestal or whatever that is, the diving board. Mm -hmm. They're on a very high diving board and they took they take a massive leap into the water. That's what it looked like to me. It looked like she was taking a dive, but what was she diving into? I have no idea. But what I did <laughs> notice is that she did not have the cape on her. So that's kind of what made it look like she was diving. She, I guess she took off the cape at one point or Joe Stanton forgot to draw the cape. I'm not sure. <laughs> But it looked to me like she was diving. I just couldn't figure out where she was diving to. Yeah, that was a little bit of a weird panel. I, I chuckled at that. Um, the one other panel that I'm I'm curious what y'all make of uh, Ashford, when we've got Huntress taking on the the giant glowing bat that was, you know, one of these <laughs> monsters in the city. What did you think of that? I, I chuckled. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. I, you know, we keep talking, using the word showcase. I thought the showcase... Uh, Helena quite well and just think about it we are going in order of appearances with Helena Wayne and just think about how high she has been written up to this point because it, it, it hasn't been that many appearances yet and I mean she is cemented into this group so I just think it's cool that we're going to get some Helena where it's Helena the individual and then her as a team member. But yeah, as far as like all the action scenes with her, like especially back at that conference, it was, yeah, it was a lot of uh, good hand to hand close up action combat. I liked one um, thing that I liked if I talk about this in general, the, the overall comic. I did like seeing all the other members of the Justice Society, the ones that aren't the current active members, show up. That was a really fun thing, especially since, um, Diane, you said this was the end of their appearances here. All-Star Comics came to an end. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, because the DC implosion, you know, took place around this time, around 1978. So they, DC did massive cancellations of various titles, and they only kept the ones that were actually selling very well. And so, well, the Justice Society's main book, All-Star Comics, does end with issue number 74, the stories actually continue in Adventure Comics number 61 through, no, Adventure Comics number 461 through 466. So they actually get at least six more stories before they get, you know, cancelled altogether. But yeah, the DC implosion of 1978, you know, resulted in massive cancellations of various titles, including uh, Batman Family, which ended with number 20. And that was actually the first place that Helena Wayne appeared in for a solo series. So we saw, we, we already covered one issue of Batman Family, number 17, which is the one where she meets the um, pre-crisis Earth-1 Batman and also the... Earth One version of her mother, Catwoman. We also she also meets Earth One's Batwoman and Batgirl, and she even meets Poison Ivy in that story. But if she actually does appear in Batman Family number eighteen through number twenty, the final issue of that series, and she gets at least one solo story there. So DC very clearly had plans for the Huntress when she was first created in nineteen seventy seven. Which, by the way, the facsimile edition of DC Superstars number 17 actually came out this week on Tuesday. So that's available now and they actually provide more backstory on what led to the creation of the Huntress and why the um, what plans they actually had for the Huntress moving forward. Now, originally, Helena Wayne was supposed to appear in an issue of Showcase like Power Girl did. But again, the DC implosion resulted in mass cas cancellations. So instead of having, you know, Helena Wayne get a story in Showcase as the Huntress. Instead, you know, she got her first story in Batman Family. And then when Batman Family got cancelled, she got a regular ongoing backstory or series um, backup feature in Wonder Woman. And um, that's it's really in the Wonder Woman um, stories where more of her character gets fleshed out and she starts, you know, developing a supporting cast and she actually starts to have a life outside of being the Huntress. So all of that starts with Batman Family number 18, where we first see her outside of the Justice Society and who she is, you know, as a civilian, what her day job is, and how she operates as the Huntress without the Justice Society. So, yeah, All-Star number 74 is the final issue for the JSA's main book, but they will we will see them again in uh, Adventure Comics, which 
will also address, you know, the Batman legacy and what that means to both Helena Wayne and uh, Dick Grayson. It means something different to both of these characters. So that's something I look forward to talking about when we get to those um, issues. All righty. Um, Ashford, I wanted to ask one last thing. Um, what did you think of the art in here? We didn't discuss it too much past those two panels that uh, Diane and I both enjoyed. I thought the art, um, I thought it had the spirit of the JSA. Like I mentioned before, that opening scene with Power Girl and Huntress in their civvies, uh, eating at this like swank restaurant. I think they were like on the roof, right? That was like a rooftop bar, wasn't it? <laughs> and um, I, I, yeah, it was very, I, I, thought it, I thought it was perfect as far as the spirit of JSA where, yeah, it looks modern, but it also looks like a throwback. So... Like whenever you talk about JSA, it always feel like it should have like this classic look. And I thought that's what they had here. So I had a lot of fun with it. One thing I thought was funny when the uh, Dr. Fate summoned everyone is when everyone showed up and he went like, I don't have right. I don't have time right now to congratulate all of you on your promptness. So I'm going to jump right. <laughs> into it. I was like, this is just weird. But I, I do kind of get. When like, oh, Dr. Fate shows up and we know he's been realm traveling. So they were kind of like, I guess whatever he says goes, I, I think he's OK. But it did get weird. But I do see them kind of like, well, man, I guess if he says something's crazy, I guess we do have to investigate. He is realm hopping or whatever it is he does in that helmet. But uh, yeah, the art, I, I thought the art was cool. What, what about you, Diane? Um, I'm always a huge fan of Joe Stanton's art, especially in this era, because he does... His art style in this um, in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, it's very classic looking, but it's also very modern looking for um, the the time frame, the time period. And um, he he's a very versatile artist. Like his action sequences continue to be, you know, one of the best things about the story. But I also noticed that, you know, there's a little bit of romance in the way that he draws um, Huntress and Power Girl in the lunch scene, you know, I felt that was a very romantic scene for what was supposed to be a casual scene between two women who are best friends and to point out something else that Ashford pointed out already. You know, Helen is very well dressed for the occasion. You know, she's got a very posh outfit, whereas Power Girl is more casually dressed. So I guess she was dressed to impress Power Girl. I'm not sure, but she was very well dressed. I mean, she had that whole rich girl thing going on there. And then, of course, she offered to pay the check. You know, they were not paying separate checks. You know, Helena Wayne was literally paying the check for both of them. And, you know, also the, the overall setting of that um, page, you know, they're on the rooftop, you know, which is something very associated with Batman and Catwoman. You know, a lot of that romantic, um, I guess you could say episodes tend to happen on rooftops with Helena's parents. And so we've got Huntress and Power Girl on a rooftop having lunch together at a very fancy restaurant. And there's even flowers on the table. And in one of the panels, we see Helena Wayne kind of caressing one of the flowers on the vase there in a very romantic way. So I felt it was a very romantic scene for what was going for what was actually taking place there. So Joe Staten has a very versatile drawing style you know he can draw amazing action sequences but he can also draw you know um interesting you know slice of life um scenes he can also draw romance i think but you know he does a little bit of everything in this one I, um issue i you All know Star. what i didn't see that um as the relationship i mean people treat each other to lunch you know hey i'll take you out to lunch that that sort of a thing it didn't hit me as weird as far as uh, what's the relationship between these two? Is it this or is it that? That didn't occur to me because I know this is one of your theories that the, that they have a relationship that's closer than just friends. Um, but the only well in the New Fifty Two, but no, in pre Crisis, I'm talking about the aesthetic. Oh, I'm okay. Because I was like, yeah. what? Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes I'm a whole about lot of sense. Classic. Thank you. Hey. Hey, kind of classic, kind of romantic, and kind of pulp mm -hmm. as well. The only thing I found weird was when she's grabbing her around the waist. That was sort of a weird way to travel, but I thought, well, maybe that's the most efficient way to get from A to B. Yeah, and I was commenting on the aesthetic, you know, because obviously <laughs> the, the lunch scene is between two friends, you know, trying to sort out Power Girl's problem with um, 
I don't know how to be Karen Starr, you know, but I'm talking about the way that Joe Staten drew the scene. To me, it looked very romantic to me because, you know, they're in a very, everything, it's got a lot of romantic aesthetic, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not saying that these two are in a romantic relationship, you know, that's not what's being conveyed on the text, but the way that it's presented, you know, it looks very romantic in my opinion, you know, especially the way that Helena is dressed. You know, she's got a very fine outfit on, you know, and Power Girl's very casually dressed. And I'm like, why is Helena dressed to impress and Power Girl is not, you know? So, yeah, she's kind of showing off her, uh, I guess you could say, her rich girl assets or something. But, yeah, um, I felt that the aesthetic, the aesthetic itself was very romantic, the way that it was framed. And then you've got action sequences and then you've got, um, what was it? <laughs> That one scene where they where they're in another dimension, I think it is. I don't know where the master summon is supposed to be there in some other realm or something, but yeah, he does a little bit of everything there. He's got, you know, a good handle on sci-fi imagery, he's got a good handle on um action sequences, and um also he's very good at drawing civilian scenes, but it's also kind of romantic how he draws that um that one page with Huntress and Power Girl. So yeah, he's very versatile. I think this is probably the one issue where we get the most versatile Joe Staten art. He does a little bit of everything from sci-fi to um, action to, you know, a casual, you know, encounter that is also presented with very romantic aesthetics. So he, this is like probably Joe Staten at his peak, in my opinion. Well, I definitely, oh, yeah, I definitely love his his figures and and faces. That they're very expressive. Um, you you know what's going on, what people are thinking just by the way they look, which is um, really nice. That you know we don't have to have a narrator telling us you know her heart's pounding. No, you can see it when she's coming in to fight the bad guys, and it's like okay, oh now here we go. And um, we were saying some of the set pieces are real nice. There's a splash page. Um, when they first get to the conference of the, the building they're in, it's very detailed up on this roof. It's really neat. And uh, yeah, the, the uh, comedy moments, those those few beats in here that are comedy come off really well. At least we found them humorous, I should say. I don't know if they were supposed to be. But, you know, it made for a fun, light part of this issue that I think could have gotten much more bogged down. Um, even though it's perhaps not my favorite, I, you know, it, it was nice to see her in action. Now, another thing I want to bring up as well is that I find it very interesting that when you see Power Girl in her civilian identity, you know, in her civilian clothes even, you know, she's very nervous looking. She's kind of very, you know, self-conscious and she's less confident as Karen Starr. But when we see her in action as Power Girl, we see that sudden switch from awkward i feel out of place to yes finally i'm in my elements i really love how that transition <laughs> i really love how that transition happened you know in the lunch scene where you know we've got awkward karen star suddenly become the confident and i'm ready to fight power girl and that just that was so great i love the way that joe staten depicted that it was just it always makes me laugh um you get power you get awkward karen suddenly become power girl and she's back in her element and when you get to the fight scene you know we see that Karen is finally you know comfortable being herself again so I think that was really I think that was very well conveyed you know just how difficult it is for for power girl for Kara to be Karen Star versus power girl and when we finally see her in action you know she's very much in her element she's finally you know confident again she's finally you know speaking what's on her mind you know she's afraid to do that during the lunch scene with Helena but then she's finally you know her authentic self again when she's power girl so it's kind of like I don't know I don't know how to best describe that but I kind of find it hilarious that you know she doesn't know how to be as Karen Starr but as the moment she's power girl she lets loose it's like she doesn't feel like she has to constrain herself quite as much you know I don't know if anyone else noticed that where she's very constrained she's kind of self-conscious she's kind of nervous looking and then suddenly bam we've got confident power girl again don't know if anyone else noticed that besides me oh no no she came across it was nice to see the, the leap into action like you were saying 
um, when they show her, you know, getting ready to fly over. One of the things, I, I'm sorry, I thought we were going to wrap up, but I have one more question for you, Diane. Um, since we're on yeah. Power Girl, what exactly is her um, strength level supposed to be? Because she gets hit with something in, in one of these battles and, and falls down. Hawkman has to go in and catch her. I was curious um, because we did that in a hospital scene um, an issue or two back where she got hit with something. So I was curious, what is her power level supposed to be? So this was actually something that was established much earlier on in All-Star Comics when Power Girl first appeared. It was established in one of the earlier issues that she's strong, but she's not as strong compared to Supergirl. So she's got she's slightly weaker than Supergirl. Now, whether or not that can be attributed to the fact that she was in a spaceship for a long time, I get that's my personal theory. But, you know, they they're not really specific on why that difference exists. They were kind of trying to attribute that to the fact that Power Girls from Earth 2 and Supergirl is from Earth 1. But they established in one issue of All Star that Supergirl is much, much stronger than Power Girl mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, Power Girl is, in, in terms of physical strength, is a slightly weaker than um, the Earth 1 Supergirl. And so she's a bit more vulnerable, which is why she, you know, is able to be knocked out by, you know, stronger bigger weapons mm -hmm. in a way that Supergirl would never be and even in terms of physical strength you know she power girl cannot move a building in the same way that Supergirl can so moving a building is effortless for Supergirl but it takes a bit requires a bit more effort for power girl so yeah it is established in an earlier issue of all-star that power girl is slightly weaker than Supergirl in terms of power level so she's still um, invulnerable compared to the other members of the Justice Society, but she's not as strong compared to the Earth-1 Kryptonians. That's actually something that is explicitly established in one of the earlier issues. Well, thank you for filling us in. Um, that's everything I had. Um, I think we've explored this issue uh, from the Hunter side as best we can. You want to wrap us up? Yeah, so, hey, hey, that's it for episode 32, right? the Huntress podcast it would be awesome um, you know what do you think about this one did you follow um, Helena Helena Wayne throughout uh, her journey as we're going uh, right now uh, write to us at the Huntress podcast.com you can reach us on Twitter at Huntress podcast uh, you can support the show by going to Apple Podcasts, writing a review, giving us a five-star rating so other people can find the show. And also, it would be very neat uh, for those of you that uh, you listen to Spotify. We're also on Spotify. This is a joint venture with the Bad Girl Podcast. So if you go to Spotify, write in the Bad Girl forward slash Huntress Podcast. It's all there for you. So please stay with us th through this pandemic uh happy 80th birthday to dr fates that came out in may 1940 this is just amazing stuff so to see helena wayne and her brilliance and see her to be connected to this legacy it it's an awesome time for the organization so until next time guys cheers <laughs>